Office's estimated need for affordable housing for persons with serious behavioral health conditions living in Nebraska. Uh, methodology used to determine need and projected need findings, and then strategic goals. I'm gonna skip down to that part, the uh, estimated need for affordable housing for persons with severe behavioral conditions living within Nebraska. So that is on page 34. And let's see here. Okay, estimated need for affordable housing for persons with serious behavioral health conditions living within Nebraska. Methodology, methodology used to determine need. This section employs a limited methodology to identify a range of housing needed for people with a behavioral health diagnosis in Nebraska. DBH could continue to identify internal and external sources to identify specific housing services and housing and service needs One for minute. individuals. Thank you, Mr. President. Service needs for individuals with complex needs that are not currently in supportive housing. Among the populations that need further study are people with a mental health or substance use diagnosis, transition age youth, older adults with co-occurring medical and behavioral health needs, and individuals involved with the correction, the criminal justice system. TAC consulted numerous data sources to identify the approximate need for PSH for persons with serious behavioral health conditions overall housing market conditions. As part of the consolidated planning con plan process, the Nebraska carries out a comprehensive assessment of housing conditions and market conditions throughout the state. This assessment includes access to data and maps provided by HUD's econ planning suite, public comments, point in time data, and other statistics compiled and presented by different state agencies. The following is a summary of some of the cons, con plans, key That's findings. your time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. And you're recognized to speak, and, and this is your last time on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, the following is a summary of some of con plans, key findings. These are bullet points. A significant number of single person households, particularly those who are low income and have special needs, are in need of housing assistance. Approximately 81,000 persons in Nebraska live with SMI. I'm gonna pause for a second. There are a lot of uh, like acronyms in here. I, I don't know what they mean. Um, otherwise I would, I would define them so I don't know what SMI stands for. I assume that since I've jumped down to page 34 of this report or this plan, that perhaps they were defined earlier in the report. So my apologies to everyone. Okay, resuming. Many of these individuals rely on SSI because their mental illness prevents them from finding employment. The average cost of a studio apartment in Nebraska is 73% of the average SSI payment. I believe that's probably social security insurance payment, making housing unaffordable for many living with an SMI in the state. There is a significant unmet housing need in the state for persons with SUDs. There are approximately 9,063 individuals in Nebraska with SUDs. A majority, 51.6% of these persons, are between the ages of 18 and 35. The value of housing throughout Nebraska is relatively low in comparison to the national average. As noted, below the median home value is $123,900. And has increased 43% since 2000. While the national average median home value is $176,700, the amount paid per month for rent is also relatively low compared to the national average. 
approximately 93% of the population pays $999 a month or less. And over 47% of the population pays less than $500 a month. Based on the number of households earning 0 to 30% of the AMI, there are not enough rental units in Nebraska affordable to households earning 30% of HUD area median family income. With only 20,285 units available, Past experience has shown that the lack of available affordable rental housing is due to lack of sufficient contractors, lack of bank financing, and the overall costs of producing units within some areas of the state. Overall, more TBRA for the non-homeless special needs population is needed throughout the state. Point in time count or PIT. The three COCs in Nebraska conduct a point-in-time pit count of sheltered and unsheltered homeless on the same night during the last week in January. The results in the tables, six and seven, are the most recent publicly available data from the statewide point-in-time count conducted on January 22nd, 2015. Table six, Nebraska's 2014, 2015 point in time. One minute. Thank you. Household type, household without children, emergency shelter, 976. Household with at least one child, one adult and one child, 152. Households with only children, 15. That's at the emergency shelter. Uh, total households, person in households without children, 991. Persons in households with at least one child and one adult, 481. Persons in households with only children, 21. The COC's use of methodology to quantify those who are homeless and the special populations they represent. The following table extrapolates some of the data, that data into the behavioral health categories of SMI, chronic substance use, CSA, and chronically homeless individuals, long-term That's your time, system. Senator. Thank you. Seeing no one in the queue, Senator Walls, you're recognized to close on AM 13 and you wave on AM 1383. There's been a request for call the house. The question is, shall the house go under call? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. 12 days, one day to go under call, Mr. President. The House is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those senators outside the chamber, please return and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call.
Senators Day and DeBoer, please return to the chamber and record your presence. The House is under call. All unexcused senators are now present. Members, the question is the adoption of AM 1383. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. Forty-six A's, no nays on the adoption of Senator Wall's amendment. Thank you. The amendment is adopted. I raise the call, Mr. Clerk, for items. Mr. President, the next motion, Senator Michaela Cavanaugh would move to recommit LB 92 to committee. Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, you're recognized to open on your motion. Great. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'll just get in the queue. Okay, so we've got, including the dinner break, cloture is in two hours and 16 minutes, to be precise. <laughs> um, okay. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? I'm doing good. I'm not tired. You're tired. <laughs> okay. So yesterday I was talking about food costs, cost, TANF, and I went on a journey, as I sometimes do, talking about the <laughs> making my kids spaghetti and meat sauce and then broccoli and then how... Uh, growing up, we always had broccoli with spaghetti and meat sauce because my mom watched the movie Moonstruck and she was a big fan of the movie, but just also thought that, of course, broccoli goes with spaghetti and meat sauce. Uh, so because of the scene with Cher in Moonstruck, I grew up eating broccoli with spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm a vegetarian, however, so now I just eat broccoli with spaghetti. Um, 
But then I started thinking about the bills today and I, well, at first I was questioning myself as to whether or not it was actually Cher that was in the movie. And then somehow I got it like wrapped up in my mind that it wasn't Cher, that it was Barbara Hershey. And then I realized, no, it was Cher that was in the movie. But then I started thinking about the bills today and how Barbara Hershey was in Beaches. And I couldn't remember what her character, I don't mean to be a spoiler. If you have not seen the movie Beaches by now, however, I feel like that is the onus is on you here. Uh, so Barbara Hershey's character in Beaches dies. And uh, I thought maybe she died from uh, cancer and that maybe then I would talk about that today with the bill because there's all these bills about cancer and cancer um, insurance. But she didn't die of cancer in Beaches. I don't know how many people remember this. What she did die of was cardiomyopathy. I have no idea if any of the 15, 16, 17 bills in today's package have anything to do with cardiomyopathy, but Barbara Hershey's character in Beaches did not die of cancer. I will say that one of my absolute all-time favorite movie quotes is when Barbara Hershey and Bette Midler have a bit of a reconciliation. They were friends, childhood friends, and they kind of drifted apart. And then they, she came to visit her, Bette Midler. She was performing on Broadway, some ridiculous like um, Broadway production that probably had some drag in it. And I remember her song was about bras, about brassiers, over the boulder shoulder holders, over the shoulder boulder holders. But backstage, my favorite all-time quote was when Barbara Hershey shows up and Bette Miller is so excited to see her friend and she's talking to her and talking to her and talking to her. And then she stops and she says, and I just think that this is such a hilarious quote. I don't know why, but enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? I don't know. I've just always really liked that quote from that movie, Beaches. But then I started thinking about another movie with another famous brunette. I think she's considered a brunette, maybe Auburn. Julia Roberts in Steel Magnolia. And Steel Magnolia, again, if you haven't seen the movie and I am spoiling the outcome, I'm sorry, but also the movie's really old. You probably should have seen it by now. In Steel Magnolia, Julia Roberts' character dies. She has diabetes and she gets married to Dermot Mulroney, I think is the actor who plays her husband in Steel Magnolia. She has a diabetic episode and kidney failure, I believe, and that is how she dies. It was very, very traumatic. That movie, even thinking about it, I want to cry. It was like just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. But there's some really great scenes in that movie. Shirley MacLaine is in it and Dolly Parton, phenomenal Dolly Parton, uh, Sally Fields, I'm trying to remember else. Uh, oh, there's a younger, well, she was younger at the time, actress. So it was, they were always hanging out in the hair salon. And there was a younger act, a younger character that besides Julia Roberts, who was also always hanging out at the hair salon who worked there. But it was like Sally Fields was Julia Roberts' character's mother. And they would all hang out there and get their hair done. Maybe I'm misremembering it. Maybe it was just they were hanging out there for the wedding, getting their hair done. But regardless, Steel Magnolia is a movie about a diabetic. And all of that is the journey that my brain went on in thinking about how I started yesterday talking about broccoli with meat sauce. So there you go. Um, I was talking about the Olmstead plan on the previous bill or previous bill. <laughs> Previous amendment, which was Senator um, Walls's bill, and it was great to see that get attached. That's a really great piece of legislation, and I'm very excited for my dear colleague, Senator Walls, for getting that attached to LB92. Um, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to taking care of individuals with intellectual and physical disabilities in our state. But 
every time we can, we should take an opportunity to make strides. And what Senator Walls presented us with today was one of those opportunities. And I am thrilled to see that so many members of this body took her up on it and got that attached to the bill. So I am gonna go back now that I have recapped probably very poorly and completely inaccurately the plot of Steel Magnolias. I'm gonna go back to reading this article about insulin. Um, okay, how much time do I have left? Two minutes, 57 seconds. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. And this is the article from the Yale News from July 5th of 2022. In 1996, when the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly debuted its hum, hum along brand of insulin, the fast acting type of insulin, a vial costs $21. Now it costs more than 10 times that, said Kasia Lipska, an associate professor at Yale School of Medicine and senior author of the study. And it's not just hum along. Insulin list prices, on average, have more than doubled in the last decade. This is not inflation. There's much more going on, said Lipska. Much of the raising costs can be attributed to supply chains that have become more complicated, researchers said. Each step added to the chain means another entity is collecting profits, leading to higher costs for patients dependent on insulin. I'm gonna pause there. We had a bill related to this, the complexity of the supply chain in HHS. And I don't recall if it was Senator Reapy's bill or Senator Hardin's bill on the supply chain, the sort of the middle management as it were. I'm gonna circle back with our committee chair when I have a break and see if he remembers what it was. Um, surprisingly, the pharmaceutical industry opposed it. I know, it's shocking that they would oppose something that would cost them money and save people money. Um, One okay. minute. Thank you, Mr. President. So leading to higher costs for patients dependent on insulin. Quote, and we have no reason to believe that will change anytime soon, end quote, said Bailey Bacala, Bakila, a medical student at Yale School of Medicine and lead author of the study. Uh, Daryl Hannah, somebody texted me, it was Daryl Hannah. So sorry, yes. Daryl Hannah, oh, you know, she's not in, she wasn't in a lot. Like, has she been in a lot, Daryl Hannah, later, like in the last decade? I'm trying to think. Was she in 10? She was the, she was the one with the beaded braids running on the beach in the movie 10, right? Yes, no. Um, she was definitely in Splash, another classic. And another spoiler, if you haven't seen the movie Splash with Daryl Hannah and Tom Hanks, she is a mermaid. Yes, a mermaid. Now I kind of want to rewatch Splash. Uh, I don't remember. So she, when she's on land and her legs are dry, or, or when she's dry, she has legs, but then her legs turn into That's fins. That's your time, Senator. Thank you. And you're next in the queue. Thank you. Her legs turn into a like a mermaid fin when they get wet. And I feel like she's discovered and then she's becomes like a science experiment and she's in love with Tom Hanks. Uh, it wasn't, uh, thank you. There are so many people uh, updating me here. It was not Daryl Hannah in 10, my bad. It was Bo Derek. Obviously, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, Bo Derek, and that is like a classic, classic Bo Derek movie. I apologize to the universe that I conflated Daryl Hannah and Bo Derek. It happens to all of us someday, sometime or another. Um, somebody did text me Daryl Hannah in all caps. And as per you earlier conversation today, it's like they're yelling at me. And I think that that was their intention that they're yelling, Daryl Hannah, 
Daryl Hannah. Like, you got to know this, Michaela. The, the other hairdresser in the movie, Steel Magnolias, was Daryl Hannah. So Shirley MacLaine was one of the clients in Steel Magnolias. Daryl Hannah was one of the, the beauticians. I think the other beautician, I think Dolly Parton's character was the other beautician, I think. Dolly Parton, classic, uh, really got her acting chops, I think, start in the movie Nine to Five, which, while I love that movie, they do commit some major crimes that kind of just like at the end get tied up in some sort of like okay bow, but they did actually kidnap and uh, restrain their employer. Not a great life lesson, but they did also implement some really fantastic and innovative workplace policies that we still should be looking at today, like flexible work schedules, uh, especially for working parents. Well, not especially, everybody needs a flexible work schedule. Working parents have a specific reason that they need a flexible work schedule, but everybody needs some flexibility in their work schedule. So, okay, that is beaches. I was gonna say Mystic Pizza, not Mystic Pizza, Moonstruck, beaches, Moonstruck, Splash, Steel Magnolia. We could talk about Mystic Pizza as well, another Julia Roberts classic, but I have no way to tie that to the rest of it except for Julia Roberts because the rest of the movie conversation made complete sense. Okay, back to the article about insulin. How much time do I have, Mr. President? One minute, 45 seconds. Thank you. For the study, the research team used data from the most recent medical expenditures panel survey, which covered 2017 to 2018. They found that nearly one in seven people who filled an insulin prescription in the U.S. experienced catastrophic spending on insulin during that time. And that's just what they're spending on insulin, Malik. Bacilla, Bacula said, the estimate doesn't include other costs typically shouldered by patients, including other medications, glucose monitors, and insulin pumps. It actually underestimates the extreme financial, thank you, the extreme financial toxicity that these individuals are experiencing because diabetes and other comorbid conditions come along with a lot of other health expenditures, she said. The team also looked at how people use insulin, who use insulin were insured. Most had Medicaid, 41.1%, or private insurance, 35.7%. Others were covered by Medicaid, 11.1%, or other insurance, 9.9%. The remainder, 2.2%, had no insurance coverage for insulin. Those with private insurance or no insurance paid the most out of pocket for insulin, followed by those with Medicare. Individuals with Medicaid or other insurance coverage paid That's your the time. Thank Senator, you. Senator Hunt, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I'm stressing out because I just read this news that's breaking today about a law that was just passed in Iowa um, that basically legalizes child labor to a degree that would sound crazy to any to any person, I would think. Um, it says at 4 a.m., Republicans in the Iowa Senate passed a bill allowing 14-year-olds to work night shifts, 15-year-olds to work assembly lines, and 16-year-olds to serve alcohol. Um, the bill lets 14-year-olds work six-hour night shifts, 15-year-olds work on assembly lines, and 16-year-olds serve alcohol. The Senate worked through the night and voted on child labor at 4.52 a.m. And this stresses me out because, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, 
it's it's deranged to think that this is a direction that we're going. I mean, aside from banning abortion access and banning health care for trans people, children and adults, apparently strengthening, you know, increasing child labor is also a priority for, can I say Republicans? I mean, that's what it seems to be. Hate to say it, but there you have it around the country. And it stresses me out because I never thought in the Nebraska legislature that we would have a ban on health care for trans youth or trans adults, which is what we can expect coming down the pike. And I'm trying to be very delicate about this topic right now because I know that, um, you know, Senator Kouth is trying to negotiate with opponents to the bill and, um, you know, it's a delicate situation and it matters a lot to me. So, you know, it's walking on eggshells for real. Um, but I never thought in Nebraska either that we would have an abortion ban going from 22 weeks to six weeks, which in practical terms is before most people know that they're pregnant, even if they're planning for pregnancy and hoping for pregnancy, they, they likely only know for maybe two weeks um, if they take a pregnancy test right when pregnancy can be detected. It's just, it's, so it stresses me out because I never thought that we would see this type of thing in Nebraska. I never thought we would see every vote going along party lines up and down every single time. I never thought we'd see um, committee chairs coronated into place according to party lines because it's so against our culture. But now for the first time as a lawmaker in my short, short time as a lawmaker in my life, I'm sure, I cannot trust the Nebraska legislature to do what's best for Nebraskans. Even if I didn't agree with it in the past, I could accept that reasonable people can disagree about some of the things that we do. But when you see what's happening with the LGBTQ community in Texas or Florida, or you see what's happening in these states like Tennessee and Florida where they're banning books now, or in Iowa right next door where they're allowing child labor, letting 14 year olds work through the night, WTF stresses me out because what, why wouldn't I think that the same stuff wouldn't come here next year? If I was feeling more aggressive, I would try to get all of you up on the mic and say, would you support a bill to allow 14 year olds to work through the night? Because that would be a good thing to have on the record apparently. Only two Republicans in the Iowa Senate voted against that bill. Not great not pro-life, not pro-child, talk about let them grow. That's a let them grow act is don't make 14 year olds work through the night. My God. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the bill's Republican supporters said it will modernize Iowa's laws. Oh my God, modernize Iowa's laws and teach children valuable skills through workforce training programs. Must we do that overnight? Must we teach them the valuable skills from the hours of you know, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m.? Can't we just do some volunteer work after school? That's what we did in our day. I, I'm just ill about this, and I'm more sick because I don't see any will in this body to stop something like that from happening in our state. So now I'm just going to stress about it. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hunt. Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator Hunt, for sharing that. Um, I was watching the news this morning when I was getting ready. I don't normally, but I stayed here last night. And normally when I'm getting ready in the morning, I'm getting uh, several other people already, so I don't have the news on uh, in the background, but I had it on this morning, and it was talking about the governor of Florida and uh, the actions that they are taking against, uh, I think it's the largest employer of the state of Florida, Disney, and it just, yeah, I don't know. I've been focusing today, been focusing my energy very much today on just what is in front of me, just 
first of all, one foot in front of the other, but also what is in front of me, what is on the board, what, what has my wonderful staff put together on information on the bills, the numerous bills that are inside of the bills. And I've just been trying to focus on that. But there still is chaos all around. That is challenging to, to not engage with constantly. Um, so for now, I'm either going to continue talking about random movies that remind me of other random movies, or I'll read this article. And there still is more to read about insulin. That is to say, not that I do not believe that what Senator Hunt was just talking about is not extremely important, but I might fall to pieces if I start engaging in it. And since I am here with purpose, and that purpose is to slow things down, and I must maintain some semblance of my sanity, though most of it is gone, that is where I am at. So here we go. I have no idea where I left off. Uh, those with private insurance or no insurance paid the most out of pocket for insulin, followed by those with Medicare. Individuals with Medicaid or other insurance coverage paid the lowest out of pocket costs. Oh, Mr. President, is this my last time? Yes, before you're closing. Thank you. Uh, that said, if anybody would like to yield me more time so that we take this to dinner, it would be appreciated. Um, okay. One thing I've been thinking about as I've been reading is working on, like, as I'm doing this, like I'm standing up here, I'm reading a whole bunch anyways, maybe I should work on my different styles of reading, dramatic interpretation. Like, what tone can I inflect into the reading of this article on insulin? And I haven't really settled on one. As you might notice, I've gone to various tones. So I was just kind of just doing like, just tone, just tone. Okay, so how about this? <gasps> Medicare beneficiaries who use insulin had lower incomes than those with private insurance, other or no insurance. This fact combined, thank you, combined with Medicare's insulin coverage limits makes this group more vulnerable to financial burdens, said the researchers. Quote, if your income is high, you may be able to absorb these higher out-of-pocket costs, Lipska said. But if you have fewer resources, it might really drain your resources very quickly and lead to financial toxicity. And a lot of people with diabetes live on very small incomes. These findings should help inform policy, the researchers say. One option currently under consideration by Congress is a 35 month monthly dollar monthly cap on out-of-pocket expenses, much like LB seven. That's your time, nine. Senator. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Kavanaugh. Senator Hunt, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to complete some thoughts about this bill that just passed today in Iowa, allowing 14 year olds to work overnight. You know, with this, if this law passes in Iowa, we'll be in a place where in Iowa, a 14 year old can marry a grown man can be forced to carry a baby to term, can pick up a third shift at the factory, but can't see a drag show, can't see glam rock or, or a play where someone is playing a different gender. Like, what is going on with this future that you guys are creating? If we follow the bills that y'all are introducing to their logical conclusion, how does that country look? How does that state look for commerce, for business, for families, for health? 
you might get your chance to see it. Um, one of the senators says, while the responsibility of having a job might be more valuable than having a paycheck, yikes. So he's saying it might be more valuable to have a job than a paycheck to a kid, let alone to anybody. So he's basically advocating for free child labor as well here. The reward of the paycheck will allow these youth who want to have a job to possibly save for a car, maybe buy a prom dress, go to summer camp, take a date out for the weekend, said Senator Adrian Dickey, Republican of Packwood, the bill's floor manager. Democrats argued, da, 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 da. Democrats argued obvious things. Um, the bill talks about kids getting injured in the workplace. Imagine workman's comp claims for 14 year olds on the third shift. This is the future we want. Um, okay, what would Iowa's child labor bill do? <clears throat> the bill would let the directors of the Iowa Department of Education or Iowa Workforce Development grant exceptions allowing 14 to 17 year olds to work in jobs currently banned for minors as long as they have adequate supervision and safety precautions. If the bill becomes law, 16 and 17 year olds would be allowed to serve alcohol at restaurants as long as the employer has written permission from a child's parent or guardian. Um, the Senate also amended the bill Tuesday to clarify that 16 and 17 year olds cannot work in strip clubs. Uh, that's great. The bill would let kids under 16 work up to six hours a day and can work longer into the evening and overnight. 16 and 17 year olds would be able to work the same numbers of hours per day as adults. Um, it would also create a committee to study the possibility of letting teens and older, teens 14 and older, get a special driver's permit to drive to work. I think we have that in Nebraska work permit. I remember having classmates that had work permits. Um, yeah, this worries me. This is not great. Um, the article goes on talking about the hearing on the law. Chanting filled the Iowa Capitol Rotunda Monday afternoon as union representatives gathered to protest a bill that would allow teens to work longer hours and in a wider variety of jobs than they currently can under current law. About 75 union members protested the proposal Monday afternoon, yelling an echoing refrain, our kids are not for sale. We don't need more kids working in factories and packing plants, said Jesse Case. Da -da -da -da. We need to pay higher wages for their parents so the kids don't have to work in factories and packing plants. We also know, you know, most likely, who are going to be the kids who are most exploited by a law like this. It's going to be migrant kids. Um, one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. And we've already seen reports all over the country and in Nebraska and in our own backyard here in Nebraska of migrant kids working overnight in meatpacking plants. So is this just codifying, you know, current practices? Is that what Iowa is seeking to do so that kids can, can learn the value of a hard day's work? It worries me. Um, I have never believed that quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Things do not naturally get better. You have to work on it and you have to diligently defend the people's rights and the ability of democracy and people to choose what they want for their own future. And this is not that and quite a slide backward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Blood, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand opposed to the recommit to committee motion, um, but I did want to contribute to the conversation we're having on child labor. Some of you are aware that I had LR5 this year that was voted down by the exec committee. Um, and what LR5 did was it was a child labor amendment, the child labor amendment of 1924 actually, um, that was waiting to be ratified by many states here in the United States. And once it was ratified, it would become part of the federal constitution. It's my understanding the discussion was that it basically codifies what's already law, but we literally just passed a bill last week through the first round that did that very thing. So I guess as far as codifying, it's just based on, I don't know, your personal preference, whose bill it is. 
So the amount, amendment allowed Congress to regulate and prohibit the labor of persons under the age of, nine, of 18. What Nebraska had the ability to do was we could send a symbolic but powerful message and fix this historical wrong. And what we're hearing from people is that, well, it's really not a problem. Well, it is a problem. It's a huge problem, and as Senator Hunt said, for the migrant workers, um, Senator Jacobson and I were just talking about how um, there are migrant workers, children that came into the United States that would be released to individuals that were not family, and we found that there were multiple children that came to work for individuals like this that had to pay off um, their room and their board and what it cost to transport them um, the first year before they were allowed any income. Some of them were actually dumped after that first year, after that individual made money, and were, were trying to find apartments and houses, and, and these are kids, so they could continue working, and then they were supposed to try and find better jobs, but they didn't have the correct papers to get to those better jobs. Now, you can say whatever you want about migrants. The issue is these are children. These are children that right under our noses are being taken advantage of and should be in school. When you talk about the ones that worked for the cleaning service for the meat packing plants here in Nebraska and other states, it's not just Nebraska, we know that children were working overnight shifts, getting chemical burns, getting injured on equipment that really adults should be cleaning. And then for those that are lucky enough to be in school, couldn't stay awake while they are in school because they were so exhausted because they had worked all night long. And many of those were actually helping to support their families. I noticed that one of the um, incidents in Grand Island that the parents were actually taken to court as well because it's a type of child abuse. So the Child Labor Amendment only needed 10 more states until it became the 28th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. We talk all the time about how we embrace children and how important they are to the future of Nebraska, but we couldn't codify that here in Nebraska. We couldn't say that we love our children and we want to do everything we can to make a statement to protect those children. So Nebraska could have become the first state in 83 years to ratify this amendment, becoming the new champion of the modern anti-child labor movement. And it could have sent a message in this political time that is so chaotic that protecting the human rights of children is the American way. We know that child labor is still practiced around the world. We know that they are loosening laws as they just did in Iowa because we have a workforce shortage. And, and again, Senator Jacobson and I just talked about how important it was for us as kids to have a good work ethic. We both grew up in rural communities, on farms. You know, for many of us, you worked because you had to eat. But there's a difference. There's a difference between someone working on the family farm and still going to school. One minute. And there are protections for farmers. So changing the laws or putting out protections isn't going to change what happens on the family farm, but it is going to help people understand that they cannot take advantage of kids. And there are a long list of fast chain restaurants that we found when we wrote this bill where kids were working late and still had to go to school the next day. And the fines were just a slap on the wrist. So we're not talking about in summer, we're talking about in the school time. So the more that we ignore this, the bigger the problem is going to grow. And the bigger the problem grows means that in a couple of years, we'll all be back here all of a sudden rushing around trying to protect the kids. I don't understand why we can't be more and more forward thinking when it comes to our children here in Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Blood. Seeing no one in the queue, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, you are recognized to close on the recommit motion. All right. Not right away. Thank you, Mr. President. I was doing a dramatic reading of this article in my best Disney voice. Um, why? Why not? You know, why not? Uh, it is, there is an hour and a half-ish, hour, 45 minutes left on this eight our bill and so yeah i did a disney princess voice and i've been talking about movies because why not why not um and you know just just thinking about what else is on the agenda 
Can't wait to go back to talking about that hydrogen hub later tonight. Nothing like an after cloture eight hour debate and passing the second and third bills of the session, like talking about a hydrogen hub. We've got pet insurance on the agenda. What I'm really disappointed about when it comes to pet insurance is that I didn't get my unicorn amendment attached. I was being collegial, trying to move things along, so I withdrew my amendment that would make sure that unicorns were treated like the pets that they deserve to be. So I withdrew it, and now, maybe next year I can work with Senator Ballard to bring the unicorn cleanup bill. It'll be an um, uh, ombudsman, and it'll be an omnibus package, I'm sure. We might come up with other magical, mythical creatures that need to be included. A pegasus? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't spoken to Senator Ballard about what his favorite mythical potential pet is, but I look forward to having those conversations during the interim, Senator Ballard. But for today, the unicorns will have to wait. Uh, perhaps Senator Ballard and I can do a, an interim study on this issue. And uh, I, I suppose the committee it would go to would be banking an interim study on unicorn coverage in pet insurance at banking. Now that actually would be a waste of taxpayer dollars, but it would be entertaining. <laughs> We could do it as a lark on our own time, not using staff resources. Um, okay, so this is the motion to recommit to committee. We will have the vote on this, and then I will have a motion to reconsider the motion to recommit to committee. And then we will break for dinner for 30 minutes and then we come back and we have 55 minutes left. How much time did I say we had left? An hour? We have 55 minutes left when we come back and we have 13 minutes until dinner, an hour and 12 minutes till dinner. We have an hour and 12, no, 55 plus 12. Oh my gosh, math an hour and seven minutes. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. We have an hour and seven minutes left on this bill. I have a motion to reconsider, the motion to recommit to committee, and then I think I have an IPP motion and a motion to reconsider the IPP motion, unless there are other floor amendments that when we come back from dinner, people that are trying to attach, then I am willing to consider not putting my motions up to discuss the floor amendments, I suppose, depending on what the floor amendments are. Um, so that's where we are. Okay. Well, Mr. President, I think I'm just going to sit down and ask for a call of the House. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. There's been a request to place the House under call. The question is, shall the House be placed under call? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. 12 A's, three names placed House under call. The House is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call.
Senators Day. Okay. Fredrickson. Bostar. Hughes, Moser, and McDonnell, and Bosin, please return to the chamber. The house is under call. Senators Hughes and Bosin, please return to the chamber and record your presence. The House is under call. excuse senators are present the question is the motion to recommit all those in favor vote aye all those opposed vote nay record mr clerk two a's 41 days mr president on the motion to recommit 
The motion fails. Raise the call. Mr. Clerk for items. Thank you, Mr. President. Amendments to be printed, Senator Breezy to LB 16. Additionally, new LR from Senator DeBoer. That'll be referred to the executive board, LR 100. And new A bill, Senator Mosier introduces legislative bill 683A. This bill for an act relating to appropriations, appropriates funds to aid in the care on the provisions legislative bill 683 and declares an emergency. Mr. President, concerning legislative bill 92, Senator Michaela Cavanaugh moved to reconsider the vote on MO 294 with MO 959. Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, you're recognized to open on the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, so I get 10 minutes to open on the motion, but we normally go to dinner at 5.30 and it's 5.27, so do I just talk for three minutes and give up the minutes? Do we still get a 30 minute break for dinner? If I keep talking, because the rest of you can probably eat your dinner regardless of if I'm talking or not, but I can't eat my dinner and staff can't eat their dinner. I'm up here talking. Sue so, Wondry. And I don't really care about giving up my seven minutes except for the amount of time that I've calculated. So I have one more motion, or I have one more, yeah, I have an IPP motion, which is 25 minutes. And I have a motion to reconsider on the IPP motion, which is 25 minutes. That is 50 minutes. And when we return from dinner, we have 55 minutes. So I think I probably can just talk until we adjourn for dinner and not talk my full 10 minutes. If that works, I feel like I might be getting a note passed to me. I did get a note passed to me when we were sitting on final, or not final, that wasn't final. That was called the House, and Senator um, Blood wants to know about narwhals. And, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, never mind. I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to keep talking until I get like a thumbs up up front to be like, just stop talking. <laughs> I'm going to start seeing thumbs from like the, the pages are going to be like, yeah, stop talking. Let's go home. <laughs> um, okay. So we are, I'm going to, sorry. So at dinner, we always stand at ease for 30 minutes. And at lunch, we always adjourn or recess for lunch and then come back and have a whole check-in. And I once asked about why do we not adjourn for dinner and do a check-in when we come back? And it was thought that it would take a very long time for check-in if we did it that way because some people don't come back right away in the 30 minutes and I know that to be true because like last night I was in here and I was going to just let what I was doing I was actually going to do a call the house be kind of cheeky because I looked around and there were four senators including myself on the floor and so I thought ooh, I could do a call of the house right now but people were probably like mid bite of their dinner still because you know 30 minutes it can go by real quickly especially if you like are waiting for the elevators for a long time you might not get to your food or heat up your food whatever you're doing for food um or your food might have not have arrived and so i thought it would be pretty rude of me to do a call of the house with only four people in the chamber just because i was feeling a little bit cheeky so i didn't do that Instead, I just talked my way through it until I got to whatever turn of voting I was at. Um, so, yeah, 
I've been getting some interesting text messages from people about the movie conversations that I've been having. Um, I honestly uh, just tried today to just stick on topic as much as I could, but my brain is a little tired of looking down and reading. And so now I'm kind of getting to that point where I'm just, just kind of riffing on whatever. Um, yeah, I, the board, is, this is a conversation that a lot of us have. And when I say the board for people at home who are like, what, what do you mean the board? So in the front of the room, we have, it's a wall uh, and there is all, every senator's name and there's a, le a red and green light next to the name so that when we vote, then you can see it visually represented in front of the room. And I call that the vote board. That's the vote board. And then on either side of it are two screens. They're black screens with a silver metal border. So that is on the edges of the vote board. And that is what I want. I normally am referencing the board. That is what I mean by the board. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And the board is kind of, it's black and it has like bright green font on it. And it reminds me of I'm going to get the computer name wrong, but it reminds me of the computers that I grew up with in the 80s and 90s. Maybe a Commodore was what it was called that had the like blinking green square. And then you would type and it would be the blinking green when you ever, wherever you stopped to be this blinking green. If you have seen the movie with Matthew Broderick, Shoot, um, War Games maybe is what is that the movie with Matthew Broderick? It's from the eighties. Yeah, Ferris Bueller, Ferris Bueller, the same actor who became famous for Ferris Bueller. I think it was War Games. Yes, it was War Games, and he's playing a video game, and it is this like it's like that screen. It's like this blinking green, and it's a strategy game, and he's playing it, and it turns out that he isn't actually playing a game he is like launching war with russia or something man i know just just enough to be dangerous about the plots of several movies to like tell you about the movie and get it completely wrong now that i've started talking about war games i don't actually remember but then they're i know they're on the run for some reason and they use a telephone booth I don't know why that stood out to me, but they're in a phone booth. We have phone booths here in the back of the chamber. Um, but yes, more games. Again, I love I love when people text me from outside of the chamber because they're watching the legislature. War games, Matthew Broderick, the board reminds me of war games. Uh, all of that is to just say when I'm talking about the board, that's the board. And I was where I was really going with is that the board is a little bit like hard on your eyes. It's very bright. And so looking at it a lot kind of hurt, starts to hurt your eyes. And I was going down that path because I've been reading all day into the record or on floor debate and my eyes are getting tired and the lighting in here is not fantastic. Yesterday I grabbed a uh, paper box top to put underneath my podium thing here because it was hurting my back having the podium down low. Now this is great. It's nice to have everything up higher at a much more comfortable level, but the light here is lower than my podium and the light wasn't like a fantastic resource to begin with, but now it's completely blocked by my podium and as it is starting to get darker in here, it is getting harder to read the things on my podium. So after seven hours of talking on this bill and it getting late, I my eyes are getting tired and I am kind of riffing, hence the conversation about 
the board, and war games, and Steel Magnolias, and the movie 10. One and minute. Splash. Thank you. And Splash. And I quickly touched on Mystic Pizza. Didn't really go into that one. But it all started with last night talking about Cher's starring role in Moonstruck Spaghetti and Meat Sauce with a Side of Broccoli. It all comes back to Cher or Kevin Bacon. I wonder if Kevin Bacon, what, how many degrees Cher has to Kevin Bacon. I bet, she, I bet she's pretty close to Kevin Bacon, so maybe one degree to Kevin Bacon. Uh, Cher is in a bobblehead movie that I watched this weekend with my kids. I did not watch Babe. I did not watch Babe, Pig in the City, or the original Babe. I talked about it last week. I talked about the talking animals, and it didn't come to fruition because I am at the whim of young children, and they were not in the mood for talking pig. So instead, that's they, your time, thank Senator, you. and you're next in the queue. Thank you, Mr. President. They were not in the mood for talking pig. They were in the mood for talking bobblehead. And Cher was one of the talking bobbleheads. And it was a movie called, get this, Bobbleheads. And Cher was a Cher bobblehead. So she was the only bobblehead in the movie, I believe, playing herself. Well, she wasn't playing herself, which was a clear distinction that a bobblehead is its own bobblehead. It is not beholden to the personality that it is representative of, which was part of the journey of the bobbleheads, that one of them was a skateboarder. She had some, like, I don't know, she'd done something bad. Her person had done something bad, like cheated. I think her person had cheated. And so everybody was like, well, you're a cheater. But she wasn't a cheater. She's a bobblehead. She hadn't cheated in some competition. The person who she's a representative of had cheated. So Cher comes in, gives a great speech and a Cher concert in bobblehead form and lets this bobblehead know that no, you are not a cheater. You are a bobblehead and you are your own bobblehead. And every bobblehead is its own bobblehead. You don't have to be the cheater that the person you're based off of was. I guess that was the lesson. I think the lesson, I don't know actually what the lesson is on that one. So, I, how much time do I have? Three minutes, 15 seconds. Okay. So, I've got this one and then I've got the next one and then I close. And eventually we will be breaking for dinner and... I will probably be taking a 15-minute nap because my eyes really hurt. Um, they're really tired. Kindness, compassion, inclusivity costs nothing. That's the post-it note on my, my desk here. Kindness, compassion, inclusivity costs nothing. My reminder to myself. Sometimes it's really a necessary reminder because sometimes it is difficult to be kind, mostly. It's challenging to have compassion and inclusivity requires purposeful thought and action. Inclusivity does not happen on its own I think I am just going to wait to talk on my next time after dinner. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. The legislature will now stand at ease till 610. 610.